the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. We continue the Vertical Christian series. Quick refresher, what is this series all about? What does it mean to be a vertical Christian? Well, in the church, someone has wisely broken down the Christian life into three avenues. In reach, outreach, and upreach. If you remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago. And the two categories that seem to always get the most attention that are talked about the most in the church are in-reach and outreach. In-reach is the things that we do as a church family, as a church body together, supporting one another, serving one another, loving one another, encouraging one another, challenging one another, living life together, building each other up. That's in-reach. And then outreach, that's what we have as a privilege as Christians. Outreach is the privilege of being Christ to our neighbor, of sharing the gospel and living the gospel and being salt and light to our communities and helping a world that's really struggling in darkness, bringing the light of Jesus and seeing true change by the transforming power of Christ. Now, in reach, outreach, they're horizontal, right? They're horizontal ministries that happen in the building, happen outside the building. But the most important of all of these is a vertical ministry, the upreach. And that is by far the most vital because you cannot have true inreach and true outreach unless you have a vertical reach, unless you have upreach. You see, upreach is the engaging of the heart, the mind, and the will, learning to love God with all of your heart, having deep affection for Him inside, and then contemplating who God is in your mind, knowing more about God, and then having a fervent dependence on Him with your will. That's upreach. It's being connected to God. And you know how it is when you feel unplugged and like God's not really there and your spiritual life might look good to people on the outside, but on the inside, you're really not firing. There's just no cylinders hitting. It's hard to be like that. But you can't do inreach here in this church. You can fool some people, but you can't do inreach and you can't do real powerful outreach if you don't have vertical upreach. I love what Tony Evans has wisely warned about this. He said, never let your work for God interfere with your walk with God. I think that's very wise. Don't ever let your work for God interfere with your walk with God. We are so good at thinking that I am doing so much for God that often we kind of lose God in the equation. We're good at quoting Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The problem is we put the emphasis too much on the I and we forget the reverse of that equation is I can do nothing without Christ who strengthens me. If you don't have the vertical connection, there's something very wrong. So this week, I want us to continue our study in the Lord's Prayer, often called the Model Prayer. Some have called this the Disciples' Prayer. And I want us to see the importance of praying like your heart, like your mind, and like your will cannot go on without God's influence and without dependence on Him. There's an old story as we begin that some of you have probably heard before to illustrate this. It's a story about a man who was dying of thirst. He was in a desert place with no water. And he couldn't make it much further when all of a sudden he stumbled upon a little shack. And so he walked up to the shack, he went inside, and amazingly there was a well with a little jar of water and a sign. And the sign said, don't use this water to drink. Instead, use it to prime the pump. Then you will have all the water you need. The man started despairing in his mind. And he had to think to himself, do I take the risk of pouring the water into the pump and the pump not working? I mean, I will die if I don't get some water. At least if I drink this water now, I can live for a while and hope tomorrow might be a better day. Well, we are told in the story that this individual made the decision to take the risk for the well. And he took the jar, he poured the water in the pump, he primed the pump, and it gushed enough water to last as long as he needed. Now, I tell you that story because I think a lot of us use prayer and we use our vertical connection with God like that jar. We drink it up at once in a 911 prayer session and by tomorrow it's all gone and we're back to square one all alone. Whereas, if we would just take the jar, the gift of prayer that God 
has given us, and we would prime the pump in continual dependence on God, we would find that it would last us for eternity. Amen. That's the importance of vertical dependence. So look with me at Matthew 6, verse 9. We're going to read this passage together, and then we're going to pray. And we'll ask for the Lord's help. Matthew 6, 9. Jesus is speaking. It's the Sermon on the Mount. He says, In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Join me in prayer. Father, we come today because we need to get connected to you. We need, we depend on you and you alone for this life you have called us to live. And Lord, a lot of us here today are struggling. We do not feel connected. We feel like our prayers get trapped in the ceiling and never make it to the heavens. And so I pray today that you wake a lot of us up to your goodness and to the power of praying like a child speaking to his or her father. Lord, remind us today that we are your children and that prayer matters and that prayer moves the arm that moves the world. And God, again, give us a dependence on you like maybe we've never had before. And I pray that this Sunday would be that day. For some people here, that day of salvation, those who are weak and without strength realize you are strong. And today their life would be changed as they pray for the first time ever and receive your son Jesus. We ask all these things in your precious and holy name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, to review where we were last time we were here in Matthew 6, we started with just the first few words, Our Father in Heaven. And we saw that this prayer is a family prayer. Notice all the pronouns are plural. It's a prayer for all the people of God. If you are a child of God, you have the right to pray this prayer. We also saw it's a prayer with our older brother, our elder brother, because Jesus prayed this prayer. Every phrase in this prayer, Jesus uttered throughout his life at different times and in different instances. And Jesus, in fact, he joins us in praying this prayer to God. And so we are praying it to our Father in heaven. We have to come as children to God. But also, Jesus is praying this prayer for you and for me. And we can join him, and there's power in the meaning behind each one of these words. Now, we pick up where we left off with the phrase, Hallowed be your name. And a lot of people get really confused when they read these words because they make a mistake. They think that these words are still a part of the address. You know, our Father in Heaven is the address of prayer. I'm a child, I'm talking to my dad, the best dad of all. We know that's the address, but for some reason when we read, Hallowed be thy name, we think we're still addressing God and saying, Holy is your name. But that's not at all what's going on here. This is the first petition of the prayer. All of a sudden, this is not acknowledging that God is a Father and acknowledging that God's name is holy. This is not an ascription of praise to God. This is us calling out to God. It's a petition. You know what a petition is. A few months ago, I was over my wife's parents' house, and they live in a homeowners association, and there was a neighbor who was kind of grumpy because he had just built a fence, and evidently the leader of the homeowners association walked by the day the fence was going up, and within like three hours of the fence going up, the leader of the homeowners association called up complaining that this man would have to take down the brand new fence because she said it was against the rules of the association. Because the material was wrong. And so he was really shook up and angry about it. And he's new to the neighborhood. And he came over and he thought I was the homeowner. And he started blasting the association. And he had the petition in hand. And he wanted me to sign it, which I could not do for him because I wasn't a part of this association. But he said, you've got to get this to your family members. They've got to sign it right away because I want to get the body of the association to change. And so, this is a petition. It is a petition calling out for a need for something to change.
change in our lives. So look at the words. Hallowed be your name. You know, most of us don't use the word hallowed in our modern English anymore, but essentially the word means to be holy. It means to be set apart, to be different than that which is common and that which is ordinary. People often mock others, especially back maybe 10, 15 years ago, they would call people holy rollers, right? If their life was focused on God, if they were Christians, it was a slanderous term to be called a holy roller by some people. They thought they were denigrating you because there was something different about you, right? You didn't live like everybody else. You were a fanatic for Jesus, one of those Jesus freaks, if you will. Uh, Some of us need to regain that kind of passion, amen? But to be holy is not to be ordinary. It's not to be common. It's to be separated. So to say, God, I want your name to be holy is to say in prayer, God, I want your name in my life to be different than every other name. I want my relationship to you to be different than every other relationship. God, I am acknowledging you are eternal. You are uncreated. You are infinite. Whereas I am finite. I am limited. I am not eternal. I'm temporal. Lord, I am a created being. You are the creator. You are the supreme, superlative majesty in the universe. And I am dust. And I come before you, God, because my life can't change on my own. But, oh, you are different. And I want your name to be different in my heart. This is a prayer for you to connect to God. God, I need you as my Father. I need your name to be different in my life. I want to celebrate your name. I want your name to be venerated and esteemed as something different. This is important. When we started last time in this series, we talked about God as a father. But here's the thing. If you don't think highly of your father, you're not going to go to him for help, are you? You're not going to think that your father can change things if you don't think highly of him. But God is the kind of father that deserves the highest thoughts because he alone is worthy of them. Now, a lot of people also get confused when they read, Hallowed be your name, or Hallowed be thy name. They get confused because the word name kind of trips them up. What does it mean to make God's name holy in your life? Well, the way to help you understand that, there's a verse in Proverbs 22. It says there, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. So the name of somebody equals the person as you see them, the person as they are revealed. So to give you an example of this, if you think about businesses, businesses have names. They are known by their name, and their name means a lot in the community, doesn't it? If it's a good business, you can trust that business, that you can stand behind their name and their promise. But a fly-by-night business, an unethical business, word spreads pretty quick. You can't trust their name. So let's play a, a little mind game here for a minute to help you understand. Walmart. When you think of Walmart, what is it that you think of? Save money, live better. Walmart, right? That's what their name is. And the bottom line at Walmart is if you go there, you're going to get the best deal for your money. And everybody knows that, right? That's what they're known for. That's what their name means. Here's another one. Nike. Just do it, right? Because if you wear a pair of Nike shoes, you're going to be able to run. You're going to get in shape. You're going to be able to do it. Nike shoes are trustworthy because of the name, because they have a good product, right? Here's a few more for you. FedEx, where there is no tomorrow. The U.S. mail may not get it there on time, but FedEx promises we are going to deliver it because there is no tomorrow. Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. When you go to Disneyland, you better get happy, right? Because they stand behind their name. That's what their name means. McDonald's. Um, I'm loving it, right? I don't know if that's true, but no more said about that. M&M's. Melts in your mouth, not in your hands. See, you know this. AT&T. Your world delivered, right? State Farm. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. So a good business has a good name. And what they're known for, you can trust. You can rely on. You can believe that their word means something. And my friends, when we think about God and God's name, it means that 
who God is, what God has said He's going to do, what God has promised you will come to pass. His character, His plan, His will are going to be faithful in your life. Isn't that wonderful? Look, there's a lot of businesses out there. Their name doesn't mean nothing. But when it comes to God's name and His name being something special in your heart, it changes everything. Amen? It's awesome. Now, it's kind of important, God's name, because when God gave His top ten commandments, He talked about His name, didn't He? I mean, in Exodus chapter 20, the third commandment says, You should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Lord will not hold you guiltless if you take His name in vain. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. My last name is Walnofer. I've been pastor here over ten years. Some of you still can't spell my last name. That's why... They call me Pastor Josh around here, not Pastor Walnofer. Now, I am embarrassed to admit that it does slightly annoy me because I am so vain, evidently, and so proud when people call me Walnofer or Wallenofer instead of Walnofer. I always have to say W-A-L-L as in wall, N-O as in no, F as in Frank, E-R. I've been saying that my whole life. I'll probably be saying it till the day I die. It's fun when telemarketers call. I could honestly say, no, that person's not here. <laughs> Trust me. Now, I don't know if any of you get bothered when someone mispronounces your name or not. But this is the name of God. And you know, when someone mispronounces my name, sometimes I think, well, you know, maybe they just don't have enough concern for me as a person to care what my name is. Or you know how it is when someone comes up to you and you know their name, they don't remember your name. Kind of a little hurts a little bit, doesn't it? It's a little annoying. Think about that. And my friends, when we're talking about God here, it, it amazes me, Christians especially. I mean, we're capable of all kinds of sins, but how can we denigrate God's name and think so lowly of God's name that we can say, I swear to God, I promise to God, or we can use His name as a four-letter filthy word? How can we do that? This prayer is a prayer, God, I want your name to be everything to me. When I say, Lord Jesus, when I say God Almighty, those words should just inflame my heart. Immediately I should connect to my Father in heaven. And I don't want to ever use his name flippantly. I don't want to ever forsake his name. I don't want anyone to ever think that I don't care about the name of God with my life and my words. So, we are praying here. We are praying, I want you, God, to show your godness in my life. I want to esteem you in my heart. Make yourself the holy one that you are inside of me. May your name be holy in me. You know, for God to be holy in our lives, we must depend on Him to make it that way. Because on your own, you can't make God holy in your life. You just can't do it. We are told in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, as He who called you is holy, so you should be holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. We are charged to be holy, yet you can depend on this. If you're not depending on God, your life won't be. If you don't have a high view of His name and His Word and who He is, if you don't love God enough to put Him first in your life, you better believe His promises aren't going to mean a whole lot to you. And again, you might be able to fool ministers, you might be able to fool family, you might be able to fool friends, but let's face it, God's going to know what you think of His name and how you use His name. So when you pray this, you are depending on God, like you are depending on Walmart to save you money, and you're depending on Disneyland to give you a smile, you're depending on State Farm to be there when you need them, you're depending on God to do the same thing for your life, and even more because He's God. Let me give you a few ways that you can pray your name be holy in my life. And it really means something to you. First off, you can ask God to make you holy in your actions. Because, you know, if you just are a verbal Christian, meaning you only profess Him in words, is there much power in your Christian life? Not so much, is there? So you can pray, God, may your name be holy in my actions, in the way I live. Lord, I don't want my body to be used to do that which is unholy or shameful or immoral. I want to use my feet 
feet to go where you want me to go. My hands to feed the poor and be, show kindness to those in need. My arms to lift up and help the weak. God, I am the salt of the earth. You have proclaimed that in Matthew 5. You ever notice he didn't say we are the salt of the salt shakers? He said, we're the salt of the earth. In other words, God is picturing in the Sermon on the Mount, the earth as a nice, fresh cut piece of steak. And if you leave it out too long, it's going to go bad. It's going to rot, right? So in the old days, they didn't have refrigeration. They used salt to preserve the food. He didn't say, you're the salt of the salt shaker. Put on a good show for all the rest of the salt. He said, get out of the shaker and go in the meat and be salt and preserve this world that's rotting around us. God, take my hands and my feet. Take my body. Take me and use me. You know, I love it when I, when I hear of a Christian who says, I just bought a new car, Pastor. I, I have people in our church say this from time to time. Just bought this new car, Pastor. And I want you to know this is the Lord's car. And so while I might have my name on the ownership, I give it to God. So I'm going to use this car the way God wants me to use it. So if I can bring people to church, I'm going to bring them. If I can take them home, I'm going to take them home. If I can help someone who's in need to go to a doctor's appointment, I'm going to do that. The things I listen to in this car are going to bring praise to my God. I am giving it all to Him. Isn't that wonderful? That's something to celebrate when someone tells me something like that. You know what? Your body, your mind, you just, Lord, make it holy. I can't do that, but you can, God. You can change me from the inside out. How about God make my words holy? This is a struggle for a lot of us. Because some of us weren't saved when we were kids. And we developed a vocabulary that's not exactly church friendly, right? I mean, that's the truth. And, and we're around people that don't use rated G language all the time. At least I'm, I'm around people all the time that don't use rated G language. You know, listen to this Wednesday night. Uh, we were talking about the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few here at church. And I said, we need to pray together that God is going to help us to reap a harvest. And, you know, I was doing some therapy, walking around the neighborhood the very next morning. And I ran across a neighbor I used to talk to a few years ago. And I haven't seen him for years. And found out as I was walking by, he came to me. He was concerned as he saw me using a cane walking up the street. And he came, and the first thing he did, he must have forgot I was a pastor. He said, holy blank, 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 blank. What happened to you, man? This guy's in his 70s. What happened to you? I mean, he was definitely a sailor at some point in his life, okay? So, and I, I'm telling him the story. And you know what's really cool? All of a sudden, God started breaking walls down as I'm trying to show this guy kindness. I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word about his language. And all of a sudden, he just started opening up to me. And he told me that his wife had died two months ago. And, um, man, God just gave an opportunity right there. The harvest is plentiful. And I'm praying maybe God's going to enable me to be able to bring him here one Sunday. So you pray with me about that. But, you know, the people everywhere have no problem profaning God's name with their mouths. I mean, it's interesting. You know, on TV, there's still a few words, at least on uh, regular TV. I don't know about cable. But there's still on regular TV a few words that are no-nos, right? Can't say them. They're censored. You know what's interesting? The name of God is the name Jesus Christ. Free game, isn't it? You know why it's called profanity? Why cursing has always been called profanity? Because it profanes the name of God. By the way, that's all cursing. Profanes the name of God. Now, I know what you're saying. I don't use those words to mean those things. And that's fine, but I guarantee there's other people that do. And I'm telling you, you can do better by the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're asking to be holy, God, I want your name to be holy in my life. What you're saying is I want to be different than the ordinary. So I don't have to curse like a sailor all the time, even if I am a sailor. Amen. I mean, I can use this mouth instead of tearing down, instead of being like everyone else. But look, you can't do it on your own. You're not going to break those habits on your own. You might need a curse jar, that's true, but you know what else you need? You need a big dose of a vertical connect connection to God. Yeah. Vertical connection to Him. How about this? We must ask God to make us holy in our thoughts. We must ask God to make us holy in our thoughts. It is a battle, isn't it? A constant battle to keep our minds pure before God. I know, because you turn on the television... Netflix is what we've got in our house. Turn on Netflix and you start watching. And you just, I mean, I read the reviews and it doesn't matter what the review says. You're still going to get bombarded with something that's not cool. 
It is easy for us to fill our minds with things that are violent, to divulge in sexual fantasy, and instead we must change that and use our minds to think on good things. You know what? When you're at work, use your mind to think on good things. How can I be the best employee? I want to be holy. I want to be different. I don't want to be ordinary. I want to be better than ordinary. How can I be that kind of person here? How can I be Christ to my neighbor? I don't just want to be another neighbor. I want to be the neighbor that cares about that guy. You know what? No one else in the whole neighborhood may know his wife died, but I know now, and I'm responsible for that, right? And I want my mind, I want to think hard on how I can help this guy. How can I bring him to Jesus? Who did you think about this week that you wanted to bring to Jesus, and you wanted on this Sunday to have everything change in their life? That's what hallowed be your name is. We must ask God to make us holy in our emotions. You know, some of us have a problem with anger. Anger is not a sin, but unrighteous anger is. You know, the Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Unrighteous anger, though, is a little different than just being angry, isn't it? You know, Jesus got angry, but he had a right to get angry at times. Sometimes you might have a right to be angry, that's fine. But don't sin. Don't let the anger take over you. Be different than that. Lord, help me with my self-pity. Help me, Lord. Think about this, God. I want to love the things you love. I want to hate the things you hate. And I want my heart to be broken for the things you're broken for. If you haven't thought about God the last six days of this week, and now you're thinking about Him for the first time today, you are not praying for God's name to be hallowed in your emotions. You're just not. And so that can change today. Your life can be so different. And then lastly, I think we can ask God to make us holy in our worship. You know, when we worship properly... We don't leave the building asking, what did I get out of worship? We don't. We leave the building asking, what did God get out of that worship? What did God get out of me? That's when worship is about God, right? I mean, you should pray when you come in this place. Lord, I want to hear from you. I want to see you. I want to be changed by you. I need you. I can't do this this week. I am depending on you, God, wholeheartedly. Yes, you should come that way. But I want you to understand something. You've got to understand that when you get in here, you are supposed to be disconnecting from the horizontal for a minute, from the world. And you are supposed to be connecting vertically and pouring it all out to God, letting Him know, God, I am nothing, but you are my everything, and I want to connect to you, I want to connect to your people, and then I want to go out in this world and let everyone help them plug in to your love. I want them to connect and know that Jesus is great. No worship, adoration, or obedience can flow from a heart that does not regard the name of God. I love what one of the Puritans said about this petition. The Puritan Thomas Watson reminded us something wonderful about this prayer. He said, this is the only petition in the Lord's Prayer that will last for eternity. Listen to this. This is really good. When some of the other petitions in this prayer will be useless and out of date, as we shall not need to pray in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, because in heaven there will be no hunger, nor forgive us our trespasses, there will be no sin in heaven, or lead us not into temptation, because praise God, that old serpent won't be in, there, won't be in heaven to tempt us. Amen? Amen? God will have crushed his head and he will be gone. Yet, the hallowing of God's name will be of great use and request in heaven, because we shall forever be singing hallelujah, which is nothing else but the hallowing of God's name. There is nothing profane in heaven, and we will be saying forever, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come, and we will be perfectly connected to God at that time vertically. There will be no interruptions in service. It will be full happiness, full joy, full love forever and ever. Amen. You know, there is one other amazing thing about this prayer, and we're done. One more amazing thing. When we pray, hallowed be thy name, your name. We are petitioning the name that has all authority, all power, and all goodness, and that is Jesus Christ, right? I mean, when we meet together, this church, let it be known today, from this day forward, and I've been trying to do this for some years, but from this day forward, our church is all about Jesus, right? It's all about Jesus here. 
Acts 4 tells us something wonderful. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name. No other name. He's not common. He's not ordinary. No other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. But the name of Jesus. I was reading wonderful writer Dietrich Bonhoeffer told you about him a little bit here in different services. He was a, a German pastor, a Lutheran during World War II, who stood against Hitler in Germany. He, he wrote a lot about prayer. And he wrote about this petition. And listen to what he said. He, say, he said here, May God, when we pray, hallowed be thy name. We are praying, may God protect his holy gospel from being obscured and profaned by false teaching and by unholy living. May he ever make known his name to us, his disciples in Jesus. And may he enable all preachers to proclaim the pure gospel of saving grace and convert the enemies of his name. In other words, when you pray, how would be your name? Make your name holy. You're praying for Jesus to fill your heart, Jesus to fill your life, Jesus to fill your mind, Jesus to control your arms, Jesus to control your legs, Jesus to take over and be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God have control through your son. Look, Jesus, his love is amazing. And he wants to connect to people today. But it starts with going to him as a good father. And having the reverence for his name that is due. Knowing that Jesus loves you. That Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. In his will, what theologians call his desiderative will. He is not willing that you would perish he weeps over those who are perishing, those who are not connected. He is weeping for you. He wants your life to be changed today. He wants you to be saved. And He loves you so much that when you were without strength, when you were not connected vertically to God, in fact, when you were not seeking God and you were running from God as fast as you can, the Bible tells us when we, when we were not seeking Him, the Lord came seeking us. He came after us. Jesus came for you to change it all. And there is power in His name to connect you to God today. Look, it's not about the words you pray. It's about the heart behind them. As you call out to Jesus, He'll change your life. He'll change your all. He'll change this church. He'll change this city. I believe that. He's going to do it, amen, by faith. Can we believe today that God's going to change some hearts this morning? We're going to pray right now. We're going to end this message. And look, I want you right now to get real with God. If you have not been connected to Him, there is power in Jesus' name. Jesus will forgive your sins. That's why He died for you. He rose again. He'll give you life. He'll open the connection. You call out to Him right now. Let's just bow our heads and our hearts before God. Right now, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to, to call out to the name of Jesus. Right now, deep inside, I want you to just call out to Him and ask Him to have mercy on you. To forgive you. To change you. For His name to be great inside of you. Jesus' powerful name, I pray, that I would be connected to you like never before. Lord God, I pray for all of us that are here today. For these who might have just prayed to receive Your Son, I just rejoice, Lord. I rejoice in this. For any God who are believers here today, who have been running, who have been disconnected, I pray today that they will start praying for the howling of your name, the holiness of your name in their hearts and in their lives from this day forth and forevermore. And that this week will be the start of something new. That this week will be different because your name is great and worthy to be praised. We love you, Lord Jesus. And we just thank you for what you've just done in your precious and holy name. And God's people said, Man, can we give God praise for what he's done this morning? That's what praise. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist. And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, 
My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.